Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. It was hard to be a Tsar. Russia is not an easy country to rule. 20 sovereigns of the Romanov dynasty reigned for 304 years, from 1613 until Sardom's destruction by the revolution in 1917. Their ascent started in the reign of Ivan the Terrible and ended in the time of Rasputin. Romantic chroniclers of the tragedy of the last Tsar like to suggest that the family was cursed, but the Romanovs were actually the most spectacularly successful empire builders since the Mongols. The Russian Empire it is estimated, grew by 55 square miles per day after the Romanovs came to the throne in 1613, or 20,000 square miles per year. By the late 19th century, they ruled one-sixth of the Earth's surface, and they were still expanding. Empire building was in the Romanovs' blood. Thus begins the introduction to the Romanos by Simon Sebag Montefiore, the book I'm covering today. This is book 26 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. The Romanovs were the Tsars. They were the supreme leaders, the autocrats of Russia. It started with Michael I and ended with Nicholas II. And actually, if you want to be technical and ironically, it ended with Michael II. So started with Michael I, ended with Michael II. But Michael II ruled for all of one day, and so Nicholas II is usually referred to as the final Tsar. In between those two, uh, the first and the last, you had some famous Tsars like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and Alexander I, who perhaps also would have been called the Great had another Alexander not had that title. I went into reading this book with almost no knowledge of this period of Russian history. I couldn't have told you that Peter the Great was a Romanov or, or even how Rasputin fit into the equation. This book was arranged in a, in a, just a brilliant way. Each chapter is called a scene and it contains a list of characters who uh, are called the cast. So it's almost like a Shakespeare play. Uh, it's awesome because it adds l some light to the to the content, but it also provides a really nice reference tool. So say you you start the chapter and, and uh, you, you pick up the next day and you just need a quick refresher and you just go back to the beginning of the chapter and it lists all the people that will be referenced in that chapter and who they are, uh, if they were the Tsar, how long they ruled, uh, who they were married to, all that. So it was a, a great way of organizing the book. And the chapters more or less aligned with the different Tsars. I mean, some of the chapters... Uh, there'd be maybe two two chapters per per SAR, but uh, for the most part, it was one chapter per SAR. I first learned about this author in Costco, that uh, that bastion of of culture. Uh, I saw the book Jerusalem by the same author, and uh, it intrigued me enough to add it to my 2018 reading list. So I really enjoyed that book and the author's style. And so then when I saw the Romanovs written by the same author, and I saw it in my local bookstore here in Franklin, Tennessee, Landmark Booksellers, I figured I'd, I'd give it a try. Uh, I trusted the author and I wanted to learn more about Russian history and then specifically about the Romanovs. So who is this book for? Well, it's, it's a very broad overview of this time. And it's a good place to start if, like me, you know nothing of this history. It's also a book if you're interested in the ruling family. As the title suggests, it's a book about the Romanovs. It's not a book about the daily life of peasants or serfs in Russia during the 1800s. It's almost entirely focused on the ruling family. And Obviously, the, the ruling family is going to interact with, uh, with other leaders and other countries. And so you, you may know some of that history, uh, perhaps Napoleon. And, and so there'll, there'll be bits and pieces that, that you recognize. But uh, this book is about the Romanovs. It's about their love letters and their adulteries and their proclivities, their fascination with dwarfs, their tenderness at times, but also their dark sides. Uh, so it's really fascinating in that sense. I mean, you, you get a deep insight into this ruling family. Uh, I, I would think if you like the Game of Thrones, which I've never watched, but I'm just making an assumption, if, if you're into that kind of a show, you would really enjoy this book. 
especially just in general, if you, if you have a hard time getting into books, but you but you like those types of types of shows. I mean, this book is just action packed. It's bizarre. It's shocking, horrifying, and incredible. And it's one of those where this is truly fact over fiction. Uh, that fact is stranger than fiction. I once once heard someone said that if you're watching Netflix instead of reading a book, then you're reading the wrong books. Well, this would be one of those books that's that's the right book and is intriguing and interesting enough to where uh, you, you'd probably pick this over watching a show. This book took me 26 hours and 35 minutes to read, so it, it was a rather long one. Uh, that was over 20 days, and that was 33 pages per day. Uh, each page took around two and a half minutes to read, and there are a lot of footnotes. I, uh, I love reading the footnotes, so I, I read every single footnote in the book. Uh, but but yeah, be, be prepared to, to sit down for, with this one for a while, but it is well worth it. So for the rest of this episode, uh, I'm going to get into a, a few things. The next segment, I'll cover 10 things I learned about the Romanovs in this book. And then it's in the final segment, I will cover the one thing, the, the one key takeaway that I got from this book. this is your first time listening to the Books of Titans podcast, welcome. I'm glad you're listening. Uh, I do not do advertisements. Uh, I don't like them myself when I'm listening to podcasts, so I, I avoid them. But I've, I've just moved into a new house, and the room is such that it is smaller than where I just moved from, and I've had to sell my bookshelves because they just don't fit for this room. And so I'm looking at having to do some custom shelving. And this custom shelving will also incorporate a desk, and an area where I will do these podcasts going forward. I'm attempting to raise some money to to do this. And if you've ever wondered how you can support the podcast, well, here's your chance because I need help building these shelves and paying for these shelves. So you can go to booksoftitans.com forward slash support and you'll be able to give any amount. At that link, I will keep everyone updated on the status of how much I've raised and how much I have left to go. And so if you've gotten any value out of these episodes, you can now return that value and help create a magical Books of Titans library and studio. Now back to the book. Do you keep a bucket list of things that you want to do before you die? I, I don't have a whole lot of things on that list, but one of the things I really want to do is to ride the Trans-Siberian Railway. It goes from Moscow to Vladivostok, which is the far east of, of Russia. It covers over 6,000 miles, and you can ride the same train for seven days to, to get all the way from the west to the east. Uh, I would, I've, I've read other books where uh, it talked about that, that railway, and, and since reading the first one and, and first learning about it, I've just always had this desire to do it. So was reminded of it in this book because uh, it talks about the person who had the vision for that railway. Uh, but it's just kind of a side note here, but it's something that I was reminded of and, and really uh, hope to do at some some point in my life. So here are 10 things that uh, that stuck out to me, 10 things I learned in this book about the Romanovs and about Russian history in, 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 a, in a larger context. The first is just the scope of the Romanovs. So one... The Tsar, that is a name derived from Caesar. So, you know, they had, they're going in with, with pretty high expectations of, of, uh, of themselves. Uh, their seal is a double headed eagle, which signifies Rome and Constantinople. And there was this fascination with, um, with obviously with Rome, but then also Constantinople. And throughout the book, there, there's, there's, they're, they're trying to get, uh, they're trying to get into Constantinople. It's it's occupied by the Ottomans, and there's just the, this desire to get in there. And if they get there, that that would just be a huge thing, thing for them. And you could see the see the seal on uh, uh, if you get the the hardcover copy of this book. It's just a beautiful book, by the way. Uh, but they have the seal of the Romanovs, and you can see uh, that double headed eagle. Moscow was called the New Jerusalem, and later on in the book, there are just a, a, a lot of Russians who go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And then also, and this is all part of uh, the first thing I, I learned, there's this Slavophile 
almost this idea of manifest destiny, but but for Russia. And you see that play out throughout the book. And uh, just that uh, when they were fighting the French, they viewed the French as the atheists and, and the Russians were the carriers of of Christendom and, and orthodoxy. And they were, they were fighting against these, these atheist nations. So it was kind of interesting to, to read about uh, that. Second thing I learned uh, was about Peter the Great. He, he ruled from 1682 to 1725. He had, he, a lot of his manner of ruling was, was just pure mockery. Like he would just mock everything. And so he had what was called the all mad, all jesting, all drunken snod or assembly. And I just want to read a little bit about this because it's just insane. This assembly, an inebriated dining society that was in part the government of Russia in brutally raucous disguise. It had started as the jolly company, but Peter made it even more elaborate. Between 80 and 300 guests, including a circus of dwarfs, giants, foreign jesters, Siberian Kalmyks, black Nubians, obese freaks, and loose girls started carousing at noon and went on to the following dawn. The Prince Caesar headed its secular arm along with the so-called King of Poland, but Peter could not resist, mocking the mummery of the Orthodox Church. He appointed his old tutor, Zotov, as a drunken prelate, Patriarch Bacchus, but in order not to offend his Orthodox subjects, he mocked the Catholics instead. Zotov became the Prince Pope, dressed in high tin hat and a coat half made of gambling cards and astride a ceremonial beer barrel. The Prince Pope presided over a conclave of twelve soused cardinals with Peter as proto deacon. <laughs> End quote. So just a, just an insane. I mean, this is where they're conducting government, and they just get plastered and and you know, you know are just making a mockery of everything. Um, and yet, and yet it's it's Peter the Great. Uh, Peter the Great also tortured his son to death. He he kind of found out that his son was was uh, plotting against him, and yeah, basically tortured him to death, and and was there uh, while it was happening. Uh, he had a fascination with beheadings, and this was perhaps the most startling paragraph I read in in the book. Uh, I, I took a photo of it and, and put it on social media and, and uh, it got quite a lot of com comments. And I'm, I'm going to read this because this, this encapsulates Peter the Great in many different ways. But this, this is incredible. Here we go. Hamilton was arrested, tortured in front of Peter, and confessed to killing three babies. Peter had her sentenced to death. Two Serenas, Catherine and Praskovia begged for mercy. He refused to either be Saul or Ahab, nor violate divine law by excess of kindness. On March 14, 1719, Mary appeared gorgeous on the scaffold in a white silk dress with black ribbons, but she expected a pardon, particularly when Peter mounted the gibbet. He kissed her, but then said quietly, I can't violate the law to save your life. Endure your punishment courageously and address your prayers to God with a heart full of faith. She fainted, and he nodded at the executioner, who brought down his sword. Peter lifted up the beautiful head and began to lecture the crowd on anatomy, pointing out the sliced vertebrae, open windpipe, and dripping arteries before kissing the bloody lips and dropping the head. He crossed himself and strode off. Peter, that connoisseur of decapitation who had found the beheadings of his musketeers so curious, had the head embalmed and placed in his cabinet of curiosities, where an English visitor inspecting it in a crystal vessel, noted that the face is the most beautifulest my eyes ever beheld. End quote. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. Can you imagine a modern leader doing that? Like, first off, being at the execution and just standing there watching uh, the person's head is removed from their body. The, the so-called leader picks up the head, lectures the crowd on the anatomy of the head, and then kisses the head, the lips of the head, and then drops the head. Can you just, can you imagine being there for that? This is crazy. So the last thing about Peter the Great is he built St. Petersburg. So we obviously get the name Petersburg from Peter the Great. And I just had never made that connection, not having really thought about it before. But uh, St. Petersburg, largely built by Peter the Great himself. Well, that's still number two on things I learned. Uh, those were all things about Peter the Great. The next, uh, number three here, Pot Potemkin, 
he he was um, he worked for Catherine the Great, and when I say worked for Catherine the Great, he was an advisor, but he also uh, worked with her in the bedroom. So they were lovers, and that kind of stuff was going on all the time. But my favorite thing about him was that he traveled with a garden. I'm going to say that again. He traveled with a garden, like he had people carry his favorite trees and plants, and wherever he would go. They would take that, uh, dig it up, and then plant it wherever he was. And so he he traveled with a garden. All right, on to number four, Paul, who was Tsar from 1796 to 1801. He challenged Napoleon to a duel. He challenged him to a single combat duel to determine who would win. Uh, that's pretty incredible. And I had not heard about that before. He was also assassinated. It was a pretty brutal assassination and, and, uh, gets into the details of it in this book. Uh, there were actually some like kind of at two brute moments of, holy cow, why are you doing this to me type thing? And his son was involved. Uh, his son was not in the actual room when it took place, but was in the building. And, and Alexander the first was his son. Alexander didn't think they were going to kill him, and, he, and they asked the, the people not to kill his father. But So there was regicide and patricide. The, he, he was partly responsible for killing the king, and on top of that, killing his father. He never really got over that, Alexander I. So that goes into number five and things I learned, and now we get into Alexander I. He ruled from 1801 to 1825. He had a budding friendship with a certain Frenchman named Napoleon. Now, they were corresponding, and but at some point, Napoleon starts advancing towards Russia. And he sent Alexander a letter saying, The private feelings I bear for you are not in the least affected by these events. End quote. So basically, Napoleon's telling Alexander the First, "Hey, by the way, uh, I'm about to attack, and I, I really want to annihilate you and, and annihilate Russia. But the the personal feelings I bear for you in friendship are, should not be affected by these events." It's a pretty insane thing to say, but I, I think it kind of got to a, a a key point here where there there was just a different level of people at that time where the the rulers were talking to the other rulers and there were friendships and, and, you know, the other people didn't really matter. And so they were kind of expendable, but Hey, we're, we're good friends. And, and, and we've got, we've got this good friendship going that can last me decimating your country. Uh, as I mentioned, he, he played a part in his father's death, just could never forgive himself and, and really got into, uh, uh, religion, Christianity would read the Bible a lot later in life and, uh, just had this deep sense of, um, of shame and, and I guess probably couldn't forgive himself for for the part he played in his father's death. Now let's get on to number six and on uh, things I learned and, and let's get into Alexander the Second. He was probably my favorite Tsar that I that I read about in this book, and he ruled from 1855 to 1881. There were seven assassination attempts on his life, including a nitroglycerin attack where this one guy just kept bringing in nitroglycerin into the palace and housed it under the royal dining hall. And this particular person thought that uh, Alexander II was eating at the time in the dining hall, and uh, he he lit that um, that nitroglycerin, and it exploded. It killed a ton of people, but uh, Alexander II was actually out of the room. Uh, when that happened, he was in the building, uh, but was out of that room, so he was spared. I think that was attempt number four. Attempt number six was a bomb that uh, that nearly killed him, but killed people next to him. And then when he went to assist those who had, had been uh, wounded from that first bomb, a second bomb was throw, thrown, and uh, that's what eventually killed him. The other thing Alexander II is known for is that he abolished serfdom. Serfdom was was very similar to to slavery, and the majority of people were living as serfs. And so you had nobles, and then uh, the nobles would be given serfs. They were actually called souls. So that the the Tsar would would give people uh, as as a reward for things that they had done. They would he would give them souls. He would give them serfs, and then th- those were were the slaves in a way that would would work for these nobles, and. Uh, 
Alexander II abolished that whole thing, and he did it in 1861, which is the exact year the United States Civil War started. I mean, think of the chances of that. Think of the historical chances that those two things would happen at the same time. I want to read a few things about that abolishing of of serfdom, uh, because it actually ended up uh, uh, ironically paving a uh, paving the way for the Romanovs to eventually fall, and and that's discussed in this section. Now, first, here's uh, January twenty seventh, eighteen sixty one. Alexander addressing the council he said, "You can change the details, but the fundamentals must remain unaltered. The autocracy established serfdom, and it's up to the autocracy to abolish it." The decree was approved. People predicted revolution. Twenty-two million serfs were freed. In spite of all the fears of alarmists, his great work passed in perfect calm. The Tsar wrote, it was a grand compromise, but it was also probably the greatest achievement of Russian autocracy. God knows where we would have ended up on the matter of squires and peasants if the authority of the Tsar had not been powerful enough, Alexander told the Prussian ambassador Otto von Bismarck soon afterward. Yet the abolition of serfdom broke asunder the pact between ruler and nobility that had made Russia, leaving the Tsar to base his power on the rifles of his army and the carpus of his unloved bureaucracy. Unmoored by this anchor, the Romanovs and society started to drift apart. End quote. So it's kind of an a interesting side note on, on that, that um, the, the brutality of serfdom was, was there, but when it was abolished, it also disrupted the the way that society had been set up and that eventually was the downfall part of the downfall of of the romanovs because they no longer had that sway over the nobles so just kind of an interesting uh historical piece there just one that had happened the same year as the civil war started and then that uh it kind of put things in motion for later on uh that was number seven serfdom number eight of things i learned in this book the just just to think of this it, uh, that Tchaikovsky, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy—they all lived during the time of the Ro- of the Romanovs, and this is a really fun book to read with that in mind. And and you get you get some information about each of these uh, of of these artists and, and authors throughout the book. And one really amazing thing is that uh, uh, well, I'm going to read it. The talented editor-proprietor of Moscow News, Mikhail Kotkov, a conservative radical, was embarking on a career that saw him become as influential as the grandees of old. Meanwhile, Kotkov was publishing installments of the two novels that defined this decade, War and Peace by Tolstoy and Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky, surely the greatest literary scoops in media history. (laughs) End quote. So you can imagine that. This, this, uh, This editor was publishing these two great works of classical literature in his newspaper in installments. So you'd get the newspaper, you'd read a little part, and then you'd have you know get the the next newspaper to read the read the next part. Can you imagine getting both of those novels and, and putting those in your paper and and it being around the same time? That's uh, that was that was pretty interesting to uh, to learn. So number nine, Nicholas the second. He's the He's the last Tsar. Uh, one thing I didn't know is that uh, he was in charge when the Baltic fleet went over to Japan, uh, to to uh, that side of the world. Uh, and, and just side note here, one thing that really struck me throughout this book is that most of the battles and wars were against Europe and and some some against the the Middle Middle East, uh, the Ottoman Ottoman Empire, but. Um, I, I was always struck by well they haven't really they haven't really gone against China at all or or uh, other Asian country they haven't gone against Japan uh, but they ended up they end up doing that and when Nicholas the second is is Tsar um, towards the end of the 1800s beginning in the 1900s and so Nicholas the second sends the his Baltic fleet and they just get annihilated by the Japanese I mean the the, the numbers of, of of dead are just just crazy for that for that battle. The the final thing about Nicholas II is uh, you may know about this, but the the tragedy of 
well, they were massacred. His family, was, his entire family was massacred. They were all in the same room and the Bolsheviks took power. Nicholas II is no longer Tsar at this point. It's uh, a year later after he is no longer Tsar. It's 1918. The Bolsheviks come and they read a statement against him that he has been sentenced to death. He asks for clarification and they say that it means this. And ten, uh, I think 10 people all shoot him at the same time. And then they just start mowing down his family. They're in a small room. And when I read about this, I, I was shaking when I was reading about it. I mean, it, it was just so, it was so tragic. And no, no matter what you think of, of the Tsar, if, if he was, you think he's the most evil person in the world or you have sympathy for him. I mean, just to, this man was a, a, a family man and he's with his daughters and he's with his son and they just get murdered and it is so messy. The The executioners are vomiting. It's such a, it's such a horrible scene. Um, and it, oh man, to read that was just something I, is, is something I will never, never forget. And again, I, I'd probably heard about that uh, at different points in my life, but I just, I did not know the details of it. I didn't know, uh, how it went down and that, that was a really, uh, startling thing to read. The final thing of the 10 things I learned in this book is this hemophilia, and Nicholas II's son, Alexei, had hemophilia. And it's, that's where you, you can't stop bleeding. And they hid it from the Russian people because they, you, know, you don't want the, the next potential Tsar uh, to, to have that. And, and Alexei was the only son of Nicholas. So he, he was going to be the next Tsar, but he had this, he had this disease. And, and, and a lot of people didn't, didn't live uh, many years with that, that disease. But what's really incredible is this disease was, was believed in, in I think it, it's true that it was passed through the bloodline of the queen of England. So it, it also impacted other leaders throughout Europe because uh, there was just so many intermarrying uh, between the different rulers that uh, queen Victoria's bloodline uh, with this, with this rare disease impacted a number of different leaders at the time and in, the, in their offspring. So the son Alexei had it, and um, he couldn't become the next Tsar. And uh, Rasputin comes into the to the scene at this time, and he he's kind of taken in by Nicholas II and his family because he's able to heal Alexei or or give the impression that that he's been healed at different times and and so all this kind of led to the downfall of of the Romanovs at the end um, and it's just one of those moments where where you're thinking what if you know what if Alexei had been born healthy uh, would that have changed anything and this book was just full of those types of scenarios I mean when, when you when you have a ruling family like this there's so many things that you know, one death or one assassination or, or one, one decision has tremendous ramifications for, for the rest of that history. And it, it's kind of fun to read the book in, in that way of what, what if this had happened a different way? Uh, what if Alexei had been healthy? Just one of those, those questions of history that, uh, that we'll never know. Now on to segment three and the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. And with this one, it was more of a question that I was left with, and I'm still thinking about it. And it's one that was addressed in the epilogue. Uh, The epilogue was three pages towards the end, and I I just want to read a few parts of that. But, But the question is this, how much of the Romanov legacy is still with us today? How much of the way that Russia is ruled comes from the time of the of the Romanovs? They ruled 304 years. I, that doesn't just go away. Even the violent way it did go away. What parts of that are still with us today? And, th- and that's the question we're left with at the, at the end of this book. So I'm going to re- just read a few parts of this, of this epilogue. Even as Stalin outmaneuvered his rivals to, su- to succeed Lenin, he privately believed that Russia needed a Tsar. He said, the Russian people are Tsarist, accustomed to one person being at the head, and now there should be one. He studied Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great. The people need a Tsar, he said in the 1930s, whom they can worship and for whom they can live and work. 
uh, Stalin was a murderous tyrant. The Soviet experienced a dystopian tragedy for the Russians, yet he outperformed the Tsars, defeating Germany, leaving Russia as ruler of Eastern Europe and a nuclear superpower. He always measured himself against the Romanovs. In 1945, when the U.S. ambassador, Averell Harriman, congratulated him on taking Berlin, Stalin reposited, yes, but Alexander I made it to Paris. Putin, Putin now get, getting out of Putin. Putin rules by the Romanov Compact, autocracy and the rule of a tiny clique in return for the delivery of prosperity at home and glory abroad. Putin's entourage called him the Tsar. Yes, yet it was not the great Romanovs who keep Putin awake at night, but the memories of Nicholas II. One evening in his palace, his chief residence near Moscow, Putin asked his courtiers who, who were Russia's greatest traitors. Before they could answer, he replied, The greatest criminals in our history were those weaklings who threw power on the floor, Nicholas II and, Mik and Mikhail Gorbachev, who allowed power to be picked up by the hysterics and madmen. Putin promised, I will never abdicate. The Romanovs are gone, but the predicament of Russian autocracy lives on. End quote. To recap, you've heard it said that fact is stranger than fiction. This book is all the proof that you need. If they made this into a movie or a, a, a TV series or a Netflix series, uh, and I know they've made part of it, and it, but if they didn't make any edits from what is in this book and they showed visually what actually happened, it would not be rated R. It would not be rated X. It would not even be rated triple X. There would be so many X's in this rating that only the most sadistic would be able to handle it, especially at the beginning, like with Peter the Great and the tortures and, and just, oh man, it was, it, it's insane. This is a book about an empire, but it's also a book about a family line. It's a story of absolute power and shocking weakness. It will stun you, enlighten you, and make you want to learn more. It will make you wonder if the Tsars really ever left, or if that style of rule still permeates Russia. If you know nothing of this history, this book will be a delight. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's eric with a K, so E-R-I-K at booksoftitans.com. Or you can even write me a letter. If you go to booksoftitans.com forward slash contact, you can see my address there, and I would love to receive a letter from you. You can follow Books of Titans at, on Instagram or Twitter, and the website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. Next week, I'll be back discussing Anti-Fragile. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out. 